All right, welcome to the John Q Podcast, a new episode um, where we talk about all things related to pickleball gear and technology. I'm John, and I'm joined by my good friend, Eddie. Eddie, how are you doing? Doing great, John. Good I, to see you again. You too. Episode four. It's been a week. Nuts. Yeah. Hey, we're on episode four. It feels like we've done a hundred of these already. <laughs> Not quite a hundred, but <laughs> we're moving along. I don't know how people like Pickleball Studio, they're on 60s or so episode, maybe even higher. They've done a lot of episodes. That's a lot of work. This is a lot of work running a podcast. It is. But hey, we get to play every week, it's test fun. new things out, have a good time. I'm having a great time with it. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, what's new with you over the past week? Not a whole lot. Just the regular nine to five and trying to squeeze in some pickleball when I can. Um, got some news earlier this week. Saw it on Facebook that there's a new pickleball center opening up in in the town next to mine. 20 pickleball courts in a, in a former Sam's Club, so that's going to be really exciting. Is this the one in Louisville? Yes. What's the story on that? What's it called? It's called Relish. Relish. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be another one where it's a pub and a food court and a pickleball? Yeah, restaurant, um, but 20 courts. That's by far the biggest one in the area. And we've got quite a number of indoor facilities that have come up in the last couple of years or so. We do. Much needed in the Colorado winter. And we just got back today from playing at Third Shot in Longmont, which is a great facility. I'm really impressed with it. And they're expanding rapidly inside of that factory warehouse they're in. They have how many courts now? Six or eight or something? I want to say six or seven. Okay. And they're adding another three, I believe. Okay, just three. I thought they were... Expanding more than that, but maybe so. Yeah, but it's uh, it's like you said, it's much needed. Winters are obviously difficult, but even in the summer, mm-hmm. the wind is just nuts around here sometimes, and it's impossible to play good pickleball. That's true. That's true. The wind is something else. It's always a force to be reckoned with. Oh yeah, well, I I took a trip to Kansas City. I, I was not there, fortunately, for the shooting, but uh, I left before then. But uh, my wife and I went. Michelle is a writer, and we went to the AWP conference, which is the the largest, I think, the global largest writers conference in the world. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think it's an attendance of at least ten thousand people a year. And she ran a symposium. Uh, she writes poetry, and uh, it was very successful. I used to, I grew up in Missouri, so I got to walk around and, and revisit some of my old haunts in Kansas City. It's a nice, nice city. If you've never been to Kansas City, and a lot of people make fun of it, it's, oh, is it really? Is I think it's a city? great town. It's a city in Kansas, but uh, <laughs> it does border Kansas. So the Missouri side is the larger side, and uh, it's nice. Any, have you been there? Any pickleball while you were there? Chicken and pickle? or I was going to go to chicken and pickle, uh-huh. and I asked if they had uh, kind of a, a drop-in, you know, where I could just mix, mix and match with other players, and they don't really do that. So uh, I didn't think ahead enough to ask you know, if, if there are some players that be willing to let me play with them. So, no, I didn't do any pickle. Well, that's unfortunate. I hear it's a great community. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Missouri, I know, has a ton of, of pickleball. All right, so I got to ask you, Kansas City Barbecue, thumbs up, thumbs down? Good point. So, there are two spots. You're okay. either a Gates Barbecue person or an Arthur Bryant's Barbecue person. If you're in the know in Missouri. And there's some fancier places now, and, and a lot of people kind of rail on both Gates and Arthur Bryant's for, for now being too touristy. Uh, I prefer Arthur Bryant's. It's it's a a less sweet sauce, very vinegar-forward sauce. They would slap me right in the face if they hear me, <laughs> heard me say vinegar-forward for their barbecue sauce. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's very good. Kind of, you get the bottle of Arthur Bryant's sauce, and it's all the all the spices had, had fall to the bottom. You have to shake it up. It's a really watery sauce. You know, it's not thick like like your traditional, what you see as it, Kansas City barbecue sauce it, in the grocery stores. Is it stores. primarily like a brisket since it's beef? It's beef town, right? So in terms of the meat, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a brisket and they have pork, you know, as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good stuff. If you want real legitimate barbecue, it's hard to compete with Kansas City in general. I had some amazing barbecue when I was there. Four years ago, mm-hmm. passing through on my way to Colorado okay. from North Carolina. So did we kind of did, did our stops of the different barbecue styles. So we uh-huh. started in Carolina, which is heavy on the vinegar. Uh-huh. It's a very yellowish kind of barbecue sauce mm-hmm. through Tennessee, to Kansas City, then to Colorado. Yeah. Gotcha. What was your favorite? I'm more of a Memphis style. Okay. I would say. What's, uh, I should know. I'm, I lived, I, I grew up in I think it's what Memphis. a lot of people think of when they think of like just traditional barbecue, that 
sort of zesty tomato base. A little sweet. Yep, exactly. Sweet and smoky. All right, well, I got to go eat something now, so I'll be back in uh, 90 <laughs> yeah. minutes. We'll move on to the next segment. So I wanted to talk about the, the Dink put out a new article. Did you vote for all the categories they had up? No, I saw some of the uh, the categories, I guess, for best player male, best player female. I didn't I didn't place any votes, no. I actually did vote did this year. Yeah, no, a few weeks ago. So they have two articles published on this, and the third one is coming tomorrow, so we don't get to cover all the categories, but the majority we do have here. So, men's player of the year. I don't think you've looked. Who do you think won that? Hmm. Ben Johns is probably going to be near the top, right? Yep, absolutely. And it's not even close. So, Ben Johns, 55.4%, followed by Tyson McGuffin at 19% of the vote. So, yeah, I think that's that's fair. So, Clearly. basically, the rest of the field combined came up with the other <laughs> 49%. Exactly, Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's fair. Ben is definitely the GOAT. And this is not like most improved right. or most potential. It's just who's the best, best player. Ben. Well, that, that would put, I guess, Anna Lee at the top for the women then. Exactly. And it's not even close with Anna Lee either. Although, so hers is 47%. And the next person down is Anna Bright at 18.5%. So I'd, I'd say that Anna Lee deserves a little better than than Ben in terms of the percentage because there is such a gap between her and the next players down. Mm-hmm. So I, I refresh my memory when they asked the question: Was it uh, who is the best performing player, or was it who is your favorite player? I think the best performing. Okay. I don't have the the notes here to to say, but no doubt then. Yeah, no, yeah. They shouldn't have even bothered with the the poll. So any surprises in here? Andre Deescu for men's player of the year came in fifth. That's that's pretty impressive. He got an 8.7% of the vote votes. Hunter Johnson's in there. Hmm. J- J- J.W. Johnson Johnson <laughs> at third place. And for the women, uh, Catherine Parenteau, not surprising, following Anna Bright. Vivian David, kudos to her. She's one of my favorite players Same. on the tour. Yep. She is so solid. I love Vivian. I just appreciate her positivity when a lot of people are just talking smack. She's just out there mm-hmm. uh, just exuding sunshine. Yep. I and, love it. Yeah. And just killing it too. Mm-hmm. She's such a good resetter. Suzanne Susanna Barr. Uh, came oh, that's in interesting. That's great. She she did so well last year. All right, best dress player of the year. Who do you think? Uh, and this, this I would is put, not for. I would say Paris Todd would probably be on the list. Yep, for yeah, the women. She's, she's the top one. I don't think there is one for the men. <laughs> <laughs> I could say it's probably not Ben Johns. <laughs> Sorry, not, Ben. Not Ben. Not Ben. But there is a. There are two guys. I bet you can. You can guess if you think about it. Uh, I would say the pickleball playing public would probably put Tyson up there somewhere. Yeah. And Tyson came in fourth, but there's a, somebody above him, a man. And this is Travis Rettenmeyer. Okay. Yeah, and he does. You know, he does have a different attire. He uses the the Sunday Swagger clothing line. You know, the kind of polos so that have kind of the bright, uh, complicated designs on them. So, yeah, good good for Travis for for ending up on, you know, dressing yeah. uniquely and yeah. <laughs> ending up on the best dressed player. Uh, we've also got Annalie Waters in second, and Megan Fudge at fifth. Megan does always look pretty sharp. She's always got kind of a coordinated outfit. And I remember Paris Todd used to run her own clothing line. Right. I think she is now sponsored by a yoga clothing store, Alo Yoga, something like that. I don't know that brand. Yeah. All right, most men's most improved player. You got me on that one. Yeah. Somebody we talked about on the last podcast, so I agree with this. Christian Alshon Christian, okay. got the most improved, and it's it's a pretty commanding lead at 31% versus Connor Garnett is number two at 21%. And then, yeah, we've got uh, kind of the usual suspects below that. Federico Stockstrude at 21%. Hayden Patrickin, glad to see him on there. I totally agree. He's, he's done so well. And then Pablo. Pablo. Women's most improved. Um, you want to guess that one? Uh, I, I mean, we've already talked about Vivian David. I would certainly put her on the list. Unfortunately, she's not on this list, which upsets me. Uh, uh, who was the uh, Who was the woman on the MLP team? Anna Our, Bright's partner. Yes. Yeah, Ra- Rachel Roarmacher. Thank you. Thank you. She's yes. number one. Okay. Yeah, hey. I think that's that's well deserved. And Hurricane Tyra Black, number two. Mm-hmm. Uh, Georgia Johnson, number three. Megan Fudge, number four. And Etta Wright. We talked about Hurricane last week. Uh, yeah. Pairing up with Augie. Yeah. Really a dynamic team right there. 
similar to Christian Alshon, Tyra is going to have quite the year uh, this year. Uh, she's got so much talent, so much upside. We need a list of the most disimproved. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate to see that list. Right. It would be all the, the older players and make me feel bad about my age. Uh, rising talent. Uh, good segue from our last one. So Hayden. Hayden Patrickin is not on the list, but our good friend Jao May, Martinez Vic, is number one at JMV. 34%. Yeah. Percent. Uh, Gabriel Tardio, glad to see him on this list, 28%. Uh, percent. Uh, Judith Castillo, and then Tina Pisnik. I've never heard that last name. Uh, Pisnik? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She, um, former tennis player, you know who she is? Or? No. Okay, yeah. She, she also uh, had a great year in MLP and uh, also in PPA. She's a, a really good tennis player. Um, yeah, well-deserved. This one is weird to me, event of the year. They, they chose Major League Pickleball Atlanta, MLP Atlanta. And I know there have been some exciting MLPs, but man, I always had a hard time really getting into MLP. It's it's harder for me to come in midstream. I don't have time to sit and watch, you know, 12 hours a day of pickleball starting on Wednesday or Thursday and go through Sunday. So I don't know the PPA either, but if I, I come in anytime for the PPA, okay, I see two people playing or four people playing doubles and I'm like, all right, and I can kind of figure it out. It takes me so long to get caught up on MLP, and that was one of the stumbling blocks. And I'm, granted, I'm a little strange. I'm not huge on team sports. I'm more individual sports person. That, that ticks the boxes better for me. But I never got that much into MLP. And after all this drama now, it's like I'm kind of done with MLP. <laughs> That's kind of hard. You may not have a choice, John. So it, it might not <laughs> right. be a factor going forward. I, mean, I love it. I love watching the exciting matches, and I love kind of the the. You know, I, I like how it is different and how it brings out different styles and allows people to kind of filter up that would not have a chance necessarily in PPA. Anyway, I thought it was an odd pick for the number one event of, of last year. I, for the life of me, can't keep the MLP straight, <laughs> but I do enjoy the format. I hope that it can be sort of revived in, in some way going forward. I, I do like the team aspect of it. I love the cheerleading from the sideline. Mm-hmm. I love the matchups that, I mean, you don't have to see Ben Johns and Annalie Waters yeah. every week. Yeah, right. And the same folks in the finals every week. It's something completely different. Yeah. Different styles come out, and uh, I, I love it. I'd love to see it come back in some form. I mean, I don't hope it fails. Don't get me wrong, but it's going to take a while to, to win me back. Yeah, over. so what's number two on the list? Uh, so that would be the national championships. It took place in Dallas, which I was there. It was, it, it was good all around. I had not ever had a chance to go to prior events at Indian Wells, California. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people were upset that the venue changed to Dallas. I can't remember the, the name of the venue. It was good, but I heard from people that had been to both, and they said Indian Wells was far superior. I was at the WPT in Dallas, I guess almost about a month ago now. Mm-hmm. And the weather was horrific. Mm-hmm. It was in the 30s, wind going at... 25 miles per hour, it was, I mean, you have it in Texas because you hope for good weather mm-hmm. in in January, but it, it was just terrible. That's funny because I remember the some of the people that went to the Duper National Championships for that Waterfall Nationals, you know, right. it was also in Dallas and the same thing happened. It, it was cold and windy and nobody was having fun at, the, at that one. So Dallas can, I spent several years in Dallas in graduate school and, and while it never gets super icy or snowy it can happen you get some ice not much snow but it can get nasty you know the the weather there is not ideal all year round what else is on the list uh, I've got uh, Minto US Open Championships uh, PPA mm-hmm. Takea Showcase and APP New York City glad to see APP in this list alright top in- influential voice is the next category you want to take a stab at that we're talking about players or other folks Anybody, anybody, content creators, anybody in the pickleball arena. Let's stick with players. Maybe put Zane near the top. You he seems it. to be uh, pretty pervasive in the in the social media area. You nailed it. All right. Zane, commanding lead of 39%, and then Jimmy Muller at 18% okay. below him. Leah Jansen, uh, Jill Braverman, Travis Redmeyer, and Tim Parks. All right, 2023 fan favorite. I think people like Annalie Waters. 
And Lee Waters is fourth place. Fourth place. Yeah. I bet you can guess the, the guy. Uh, Tyson McGuffin. Tyson is McGuffin, number one. Very popular. Yeah, 31%. Anna Bright, 17%. Anna Bright. Zane, Zane Abertel, uh, 16%. Good for him. Anna Lee at 14%. Elise Jones, good to see her oh, on there. Oh, she's so fun. Yeah. And then Riley Newman. That surprised me as a fan favorite. Although, you know, a lot of people a lot of people like <laughs> like his antics on the court. Oh, yeah, well. Yeah. You know, I I did I did meet Riley and Lindsay. They ran a clinic in up in Vale a couple of years ago and I went and, and joined it and they are really, really nice people, really good coaches. So I did enjoy that. Is Lindsay still playing? She, well, she's she's not playing until they pay her. Did you hear about that? No. So you know all of the kerfuffle with with you know contracts and right. people and, and PPA and MLP backing out of contracts. And nobody's getting paid right now. And Lindsay, Lindsay's like, listen, you know, I'm not going to play unless you actually do what you promised and pay me. You know, this is my career. So good for her. Okay, that's all there is for the categories right now. And then we're going to move on to the latest. More news on latest gear gossip. So um, I got a note, and I did ask Dale at six zero if I could chat about this, and he said that's fine. So he is making adjustments as he's as he does on many of his paddles. He releases paddles in batches, right? Mm-hmm. And then they'll do they'll tweak things that they didn't like about that batch. And you know, the original six uh, zero double black diamond went through I don't know how many iterations, and sometimes it's it can be annoying to us paddle reviewers because you know the original ones we reviewed are not so much like the ones that are currently on the market but i totally understand and i think it's actually a good business model to do that you know clearly you want to improve your product and you notice things that should be improved so he is working on adjustments to the new edgeless infinity series and he told me that the twist weight is now up to 6.8 on both the double black diamond and black diamond infinity. And the original one was a full point below that at 5.7 to 5.8. So that's pretty fantastic. That brings it up in the same range, if not identical to the double black diamond. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. And my question was, okay, what's the swing weight then, right? If, if you're raising the twist weight and the swing weight, then it's basically going to be the same paddle as the double black diamond and the black diamond with the edge guards. But he did say that the swing weight is now just 110 to 111. So that's up from 106 for the black diamond infinity and 110 for the double black diamond infinity. So it's just a couple few points. Clearly, you know, he did some things right. And, and I think that's going to be a much improved paddle. Like I said in my review, I, I feel... I didn't care for the double black diamond infinity as much as I did the black diamond infinity. The black diamond had more pop, more power, and I felt like the sweet spot was a little better. And there was, you know, there's some twisting issues with that low twist weight, but I felt like it played above its its twist weight. But man, with a full point more twist weight for both paddles and not much more swing weight, I think it, those are going to be much improved. Did he allude to? how he's going to achieve that? No, he's done it, and I'm sure it's just putting perimeter weighting right. below the balance point, you know, at, at 4 and 8 o'clock, you know, right where the paddle flares out above the neck. You so know. the static weight will be up a little bit, you think? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. That's my guess. I didn't ask him specifically how he did it, but that's how I would do it. I mean, you, you experimented a little bit with some lead weight on yours to kind of push up that twist weight. Yeah. Yeah. And what did it, you think of the playability adding, a, you know, three grams on each side? You know, I, I think I mentioned in my review, too, of the of the Black Diamond Infinity, I went back to not having lead weight, and I think I just put it a little too high. To me, the, the increased swing weight was not sufficient trade-off for the broadened sweet spot and mm-hmm. the less twisting mm-hmm. that you get. So I imagine if I played around with it more and, and positioned it a little lower, but still at the the widest part of the paddle, then... I would have liked it more than than stock. I really appreciate the commitment to the edgeless design mm-hmm. uh, of Six Zero. I I've always been a fan of of edgeless paddles, not just for the aerodynamic benefits, but just I think they look really clean, and I appreciate that. They do. I do think that it's a bit of a bandwagon right now. Like everybody's coming out with with edgeless paddles, and yeah, they look great, but 
But there is an argument to be made that that they don't play as well as paddles with with edge guards because there's not as much perimeter weighting. Uh, and then, yeah, if you do add the perimeter weighting, does it just bring it in line with the ones with the edge guard? You're paying more for an edgeless. So I get all that, but I do feel like that there is room for innovation in edgeless, and they're becoming a thing of their own, not just a regular paddle without an edge guard. Do you know what I mean? Like I said, I think that increased hand speed is very beneficial, mm-hmm. particularly for amateurs. You know, pros have most of what we perceive as hand speed. It comes from anticipating where the ball's going, not necessarily from reacting to where you see the ball going. You know what I mean? So like looking at somebody's paddle and, and saying, okay, that's coming to my forehand. I'm going to hold my paddle here instead of waiting for the ball co- to come sure. off and then trying to get your paddle over to forehand. So the pros have so many more years experience and athletic talent <laughs> and probably better reaction time than most of us amateurs. And they can have their paddles weighted up nine plus ounces and still get their paddle in position just from that, that anticipation. But us lowly amateurs need – to have a lighter paddle, I would say, than a pro to be able to, because we can't rely so much on it, on our anticipation. It's not there. We don't have that many years of experience and other things. So I think having having that maneuverability is, is very beneficial. So I think that's where the edgeless paddle market hits home in a big way with, with amateurs. I, I'd love to see an edgeless paddle elongated with a long handle, Kind of like this Harache right here that I've been using lately. Uh-huh. I mean, this is really, to me, a, a fantastic design. The shape of this, I really appreciate. Uh, it's getting really great feedback from from players all over. This shape I love. I think this is something that we're not seeing a lot of right now, mm-hmm. but I think we will see more of. This sort of hybrid shape but elongated format. If we could do that in, a, in an edgeless, mm-hmm. man. That would be sick. I mean... I guess the pro drive encounter is a little bit of what you were wanting. No, I mean, it's got the longer handle. Uh, it's not hybrid, though. It's more just elongated. Yeah, this hybrid shape is... Yeah, you're playing great with that. And and, and I've, I notice, like you had, so before this, you were playing with the Gearbox Pro Power mm-hmm. elongated. And you mm-hmm. had that thing dialed in. And I, I didn't see any issues with your control game. But I would say that definitely you had better control with this Hirachi paddle than you did with the Gearbox Pro Power. It requires a lot less focus for me to dial in that control on mm-hmm. thirds, on dinks, yeah. and the like. Yeah. With the gearbox, I was always so hyper-focused when it came to the control aspect, and I could get there, mm-hmm. but with this, it's a lot more automatic. Really enjoying this paddle. And that's kind of a good insurance policy to have, where, especially when you're in pressure situations like tournaments. And Man, I would never use a gearbox pro power in a tournament just because you know you get the yips on serves or whatever you're playing tight, ball's going to go ten feet. I long. think it's circumstantial. You know, yeah. if you're facing a headwind or if you're um, in a situation where some of that power might be needed, mm-hmm. yeah, it's good to have in the bag. That is true, but I think you play more calmly than I do. John, this Grace paddle, pressure. I think, is a bargain at 140. You want to know how much I paid for it? Yeah, you got a discount, right? So this company really treats like veterans and civil servants really well mm-hmm. with a 30 percent discount. That's Sweet. I'm a civil servant, as I mentioned in yeah. a previous episode. I work for the National Institutes of Health. 30% off. This paddle is $90. That's a significant decrease that's in price. That's nuts. So how do, they, how do people get the, the veteran and civil oh, servant Oh, good discount? question. So there's a, a website called GovX. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you have a .gov or a .mil email address, you can register for an account on GovX. Mm-hmm. All kinds of companies um, work through GovX to uh, make discounts available to civil servants and military and police, nurses, first responders. Nice. Uh, it's a really nice benefit, and it's really good brands. I mean, Oakley's in there, Casio's <coughs> in there, uh, just a ton of really quality. But $90 for this all day long. Even at $140, i am I'm in. It's a good paddle. I have not a, had much of a chance to hit with it because Paula grabbed mine. As soon as I got it. <laughs> <laughs> She's she been does. playing with it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> the one thing I do want to keep an eye on, though, is um, – to see if the the spin rate holds up over time. I've noticed between different paddles, varying levels of just felt grit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's um, something in in the production run or if that's something that's changing over time. So I just want to keep an eye on that. We'll talk about uh, 
about losing grit and spin potential. A little later, I came up with some interesting stats on different paddles that people have been asking me about. But a little teaser for now. Let's let's save that issue sure. toward the. Hey, before we leave six zero, I had heard that they might be working on their own elongated shape. Yes, called the Willinator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's a, a prototype name and not the final. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it was funny. Um, we were at the six-year event at Nationals in Dallas, uh, several of us content creators, including Pickleball Will and, and Chris Olson, and they were showing us all their prototypes, and they brought out the elongated one. It, it, it's I think it's the same dimensions as the Pickleball Apes Pro-Line Energy, so s- over longer than a six-inch handle, 17 inches long, a little more narrow, right? Mm-hmm. And Will, uh, Will actually gave him was begging him basically to to have that shape of paddle for months and months. And Dale finally caved in and and jokingly called it the Willinator. Oh, and then I think his U.S. manager Bodie was giving a presentation and he's like, "All right, this is a our elongated prototype, and we're not going to call it the Willinator." And, and Dale was like, "Actually, this is going to be called the Willinator." So I think. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if it actually came out and it was called the Will and Eater? I don't think it will, but... but uh, I like yeah. that better than Harache, which I'm understanding is a <laughs> sandal of some sort. Yeah, Chris Olson's review of the Harache X just came out today. Yeah. And, you know, what's funny is the, the owner is, is fully in on the joke that, <laughs> that his company is, has a horrible name. And that makes it that makes it fun to me that, that uh, he's, he's willing to make fun of himself. It's a good paddle, first of all, but I also like it when the owners of the companies are good people. My theory is that their production run was limited, and so they decided to go with a name that wouldn't get a whole lot of attention. <laughs> they tried hard on that, didn't <laughs> they? But, uh, man, I don't think that's going to be the case. If Chris gave it a good review... His, the review is spot on. I agree with uh, with everything in there. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Like I said, I haven't had much of a chance to hit with it, but uh, one day I will. No sweat to, to Paula, though, because I've not had a chance to to hit with so many paddles because so many other paddles have been in our bags lately. So let's talk about some of the paddles we've been playing with uh, this week. You and I had a a session just before the show today. Mm -hmm. And also on Tuesday this week, we had a couple hours of skinny singles and traded out several paddles. So let's kind of go through some of the paddles we've hit. So I wanted to start with the Neonic Flow because this one is actually coming out. It was not already out. It's coming out in the next couple of days. And Watching the last podcast, I was holding the paddle right in front of your face, so I moved the camera. Hopefully, I'm not blocking your face, Eddie, or causing you to go out of focus. Is your face still in focus? Curse the wolf. We'll find out tomorrow. (laughs) All right. But the Neonic Flow, um, I think Braden talked a bit about this in his Pickleball Effect podcast also, but it's a entirely new mold, which I appreciate. They didn't just borrow something from the factory. So they created their own mold, which is an investment. You know, it's not cheap to build your own thermoformed paddle mold. And you can see it's kind of a, a convex top, a rounded top. Um, it's not, doesn't have, as far as I can tell, the expanding edges, similar to the 6-0 double black diamond. So that taper up. But it is a 16 millimeter raw carbon fiber paddle with a longer 5.5 inch handle. And um, I think it's six, kind of your standard. I oh, know it's a hybrid shape. It's 16.3 inches long, so it's not the elongated. And, man, this thing is soft and a control machine. It, it really is. It's yeah. a beast on control. Yeah, I mean, I was impressed. And if, if you're in the market for a control paddle and you're budget conscious, I think this is a good choice. I, th- I think it's $129.00. Retail, and uh, you can get 10% off that with code John Q when it does come out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was I was impressed. One thing I did like about it is the longer handle for mm-hmm. doing a backhands. There was a little bit of twisting. It's, it's a little bit on the narrow side. But yeah, I thought it, it played. I mean, nothing crazy exceptional about it, but I, I felt really confident at the kitchen for resets, dinks, and just the control game. I played with the 003 for a long time and for the Lux a little bit. And this is, I would say, not quite as control-oriented as those. Yeah, They're probably a little bit softer. This one has a touch more power. So I would say if you're really into that control game but just want a little push of power, mm-hmm. um, it's right up there. We have a zoo in here. We've got a cat <laughs> meowing at a skidget right at the door. Um, I didn't notice the twists like you mentioned. You didn't notice the twist? No. Okay. Yeah, I think that the twist weight is, I can't recall, right around six. 
So um, it's it's a little bit below the median or the average uh, for twist weight in my de- paddle database. But that's not to say it, it has a poor sweet spot. It has a, a good size sweet spot. It's thermoformed and, you know, Gen 2. So it's a good paddle. I'm going to feed the cat so she'll Do stop it. squawking at us. Why is that visitors during the podcast? <laughs> it's usually Michelle. <laughs> Did you walk the dog, John? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Michelle. Where's Juju? Okay. Juju will be next. Juju's the best. <laughs> okay. And then moving on to, I wanted to talk about the Hudef Mage also because it's very similar in shape to the Neonic. And like I said, the, the Neonic Flow uses its own mold. And it's very similar, so, but it's not exactly the same. You can see that the the flow flares out a little quicker, and the mage neck tapers a little uh, more gently than the neonic flow. But I'd say they they play pretty similarly. I would say so. Yep. Yeah, the Mage Pro is also a control oriented paddle, raw carbon fiber, Gen Maybe two. Maybe even a touch more power than the. So they're pretty similar in in size and shape. What do you think of that overall design? I mean, I'll tell you I, what I think. Okay, let's see what you think. I hate it. <laughs> you hate it. <laughs> Strong opinion. So what no, don't you like that, about it? I, you know that that highly radiused top. So I like the gentle curve of the hybrid shape of mm-hmm. the six zeros, um, of the Volaires. That highly radius curve top, like you saw in the old Maxima from Selkirk. Yeah. Um, like you see in the zero zero six, mm-hmm. or is it the five? One of the yeah six. Yeah, I just can't do it. Can can we just stop with that? I mean, no. I, you know, it's funny because it's it's purely an aesthetic thing. I do like slightly curved tops. Like one of my favorite shapes for the paddle is that Proline Energy, uh, the original Pickleball Apes Proline Energy. There's a slight yeah convexity to the top. But that's about the perfect amount for me, and I like that better than a square paddle. Yep. But when it ends up being a half circle, you, then I can't do it. It's funny. It could be the best performing paddle out there. Yeah. And I just. So I was thinking about this today, and maybe we'll do a separate podcast or have it as a topic on a separate po- separate podcast later. But you know how Pro Kinex has those ridiculous round paddles, <laughs> like literally they're they're like a tennis or like it's nineteen seventies era tennis racket lollipop like a lollipop <laughs> but not like a cool lollipop like, like the groove in but like a circular but the fact is that more you're reducing your paddle space because you're limited the USAP rules are that you can't be over length times width and that is going to give advantages to square paddles and rectangular paddles because the more real estate you have on the paddle face the larger your sweet spot when you start cutting off significant amounts of the edges rounding them, then it's going to also reduce your size of your sweet spot. Right. And I understand that materials are involved and there are other issues at stake, but, but you know, the, the, the paddles with the largest sweet spots are going to be your wide bodies if you want a <clears throat> wider sweet spot. Mm-hmm. And even the elongated, like the Proline Energy, I thought that the Proline Energy felt great in terms of the sweet, sweet spot, but it has a really low twist weight because it's so narrow. Mm-hmm. And some people can't play with those because they need that real estate side to side, you know. But the point is, the way the rules are set up, square paddles are going to have, square and rectangular paddles are going to have larger sweet spots. So the more you start rounding it, the less the size of the sweet spot. So not only do you have a smaller sweet spot, but you have an ugly paddle. So it's... <laughs> and that's not... What do you gain? That's not to say that the, <laughs> the Mage and the Neonic have smaller sweet spots because no. that's, you know... Actually, I, I thought they played really well in terms of forgiveness. Y- yeah. Yeah. And I think... You know, when it comes down to this versus a totally square paddle like the Engage paddles, you know. Or um, the new Airbender by Gamma, very squared. Yeah, very squared. Uh, you're not going to get much of a benefit in Sweet Spot. Right. I think, you know, Ben Ben Johns went from the Hyperion shape, which was kind of the originator of that convex rounded mm-hmm. top, back to a square paddle because – he is so tuned into his paddle that he actually needs that extra sweet spot. I think I heard him talk about that, that, you know, on, he hit some spots purposefully off center and he needed that little bit of extra sweet spot real estate in a square paddle. What would be the purposeful reason for hitting something off center? I don't know. Only Ben John's. Probably a flick. <laughs> he loves those. Could be. Those little flicks from... I mean, it, there, there's, I guess, a deception aspect to that because you're expecting something on the sweet spot to come off at a certain... Maybe. 
pace, right? Maybe. And it might be that, you know, on the flick, he's grabbing it at the top edge and, ro- and rolling the ball across the face to get yeah. more spin. I don't know. He's a wizard. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, though. Some some may love this this rounded top shape. Others yeah, do not. Okay, so moving on to other paddles. Yeah. So next week I'm leaving for Las Vegas for this kind of retreat that that me and Chris Olson, Pickleball Will, Braden from Pickleball Effect are all going to be there. And the company that invited us and is hosting us is Thrive Pickleball. And shout out to Scott Phillips, the owner. Uh, you know, he's he's bringing us all down there and fitting us to paddles and doing his thing. That's what he's he's doing with pros and, and amateurs and big things to come from from him. And he actually he's actually selling paddles at this point. And we've played with his almost his, his entire line of paddles, all of the ones that are available for purchase, and then a few prototypes that aren't available. We hit so many Thrive paddles. I know. This was on Tuesday also, so I, my memory is already a little foggy on this, but I think that the rush and the threat are currently on the market. That's right. In, thir- it- in 13 and 16, is that right? That's right. So yeah. the rush is 13 and the threat is 16. You can see they're, they're both elongated paddles. On the square side, I want to talk about the others, honestly, because I don't remember much about these two in particular. Uh, in general, I'd say that all of the Thrive paddles have exceptional spin. They're all raw, raw carbon fiber and more power and pop than I expected for other paddles comparable to them. So in this case, it would be you know, elongated paddles like the Carbon 1X and the, the um, Bread and Butter Filth. I don't think I played with the Rush. I remember playing with the Threat 16. I, I thought it did play a lot like the Carbon, Okay. Um, but in a really good way. Mm-hmm. I'm more excited about the, yep, the same. ones that aren't released, and these are their hybrid-shaped paddles. So we've got the Thrive Blackout, and if you're going to hold that, I'm going to pull up. Yeah, that's a great paddle. But what does that look like, John, if I took the logos off? So very similar to another very right. popular shape. Exactly. So the blackout is 16 millimeters thick, and it is made with raw fiberglass. So similar to the 60 black diamond. Again, it's instead of raw carbon fiber, it has the raw texture, which is to say a peel ply texture. And I looked at these under a microscope, and it's the coarse peel ply that I prefer. And underneath that are three layers, presumably, of pre-preg unidirectional fiberglass instead of carbon fiber. So the benefits of fiberglass is is that it is more supple, more flexible than carbon fiber, not as stiff. And as a result, you get more rebound of the ball, so it's, there's more power and pop there. And I would say comparing this to directly to the 6-0 Black Diamond, I did run the the metrics on this. I have not processed them yet, so I don't know off the top of my head if it actually does get more power and pop, but I'd say both of those on this paddle are higher than the Black Diamond from 6-0. I've actually never played with the 6-0 Black Diamond, but I found this to be quite powerful, mm-hmm. very forgiving. Um, I wouldn't put it on the, on the power paddle side of things necessarily, but um, more on the power side of... All around, if that makes sense. So all court paddle, yep. leaning towards power. Yeah, yeah. I think I would stick it in the power category, but I, I um, reserve the right to change my mind on that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> again, we played. I think I played two games with that, and you played one or two also. And we're switching around paddles every game. Uh, I did like it. I do think it's controllable. Yes. Not as controllable as some of their other options that we'll talk about here in a second. But um, great spin, good power, good pop, and if you. Have a Gen 2 raw carbon fiber paddle. This one's going to feel very familiar. If you've played with a 6-0 double black diamond, it'll feel very, very familiar. Much more power, I'd say, than the double black diamond. And if you have the regular black diamond, it's going to feel very, very close. To me, the the only thing I would change on this would be the grip. This grip is so thin to me that uh, it would need one, maybe two over grips. You know, it's funny. I used to love thick grips i used to put on top of the stock grip i'd put another two yeah i'd put yeah. two regular grips and then a couple of over grips over that and it would feel like a tennis racket to me and i've i've veered away from that i think it's because 
Obviously, I can't do that for every paddle I test. I'd have to spend <laughs> thousands of dollars on grips and hours and hours every time. Braden can send you his overruns, and <laughs> you'll have plenty. But but I, I've come to like thinner grips, not super thin. I don't like like the stock gearbox grips. I feel like they're too thin. Same with Prokinix. This is this to me feels a lot like the the stock gearbox. Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree. But this is it's okay with me. I imagine it's four point one two five or something. Yeah. Any more about the the blackout? That's a cool logo, though, right? Yeah. I like that. It's a good-looking paddle. So mm-hmm. the Surge is basically the double black diamond. So, again, 16 millimeter, made f- from raw carbon fiber. So, again, these unidirectional pre-preg sheets with a peel ply texture over it. It uses the same texture as, as the uh, blackout. Again, exceptional spin. I do think, even though I haven't processed the spin on these, I think they're all over 2,000, so well into the upper realm of the top tier category. A lot of shape on the ball, and I felt like if I had to compare this to the double black diamond, I'd say it's nearly identical, but with more power and pop. I'm waiting for the next one. Bring it on. Yeah. Because that was my favorite, the Azul. This thing, okay, so this is the double black diamond shape, and I think it's exactly the same dimensions. Uh, and same as these other two, but it's uh, they're Kevlar, so it's a similar to the pickleball apes. It uses a hybrid weave of Kevlar and carbon fiber, and instead of red Kevlar, this is uses blue. It's very subtle. Uh, yeah, it's all like a blue gray. Yeah, it's kind of a yeah, a really kind of deep. It is gorgeous. Cobalt, cobalt blue. That's your term or theirs? <laughs> That's my term. <laughs> your colorblind term. <laughs> I see blue. I see blue. Okay. It's, it's a grayish cobalt, I'd say. Uh, it's gorgeous. And I then, love it. Yeah, the, the carbon fiber. So it's a, it's a twill weave. So again, a 3K weave. You can see it on here. And then the peel ply is applied over the top of it. Proline Energy is the one that the company who spearheaded this movement, both in terms of Kevlar facing materials and in terms of putting peel ply over the top of of woven 3K cloth. As far as I know, they're the first people to do that, and it works wonderfully. I don't know why nobody else did that before them, because they were using, Gearbox was using 3K woven carbon fiber cloth, Selkirk was using it, and they were all putting grit over the top of it, which Mm -hmm. wears off much faster. Anyway, great spin. Um, Since you like this best, what what are your thoughts on it? Well, you know, you, you pick it up, you look at it, you know that it's Kevlar, and you think, well, it's it's going to be a blue ruby. And it's not. It's not like the ruby at all in play characteristics. It, it feels much more dense. Um, for me, that translated into forgiveness. Um, not a huge amount of power, but I felt like I could just reset balls all day with this thing. So predictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would put it closer to... Um in terms of the other paddles in the Thrive line, I'd put it closer to the Surge than I would to the Blackout. So, But I do feel like it's in between those two somewhere in, in the power pop spectrum. So it's, it's less control-oriented than the Surge and more than the Blackout. Um, and same with power. It's got the powers in between those two. It actually a felt bit. a lot like the, the Proline Energy, now that you I know, think of it. I don't... I don't think so. I, I no? feel like the face is far less plush and, and much more crisp. To me, this didn't feel like any other Kevlar uh, paddle, and I would have a hard time distinguishing it from a raw carbon fiber paddle in terms of the feel of the ball off the face. That's one of the things I loved about the Proline Energy, and then now with the the Ruby also, is is that uh, to me that the plushness, the softness of the the face, just helps me a little bit with control. You lose some pop, obviously. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel that in, in with this. I feel like it's a very stiff face. Probably not as stiff as the six zero double black diamond, but somewhere between that and the ruby, I would I would say. Okay. But a lot more pop. So there's always trade offs, right? If if you're into aggressive kitchen play and less resetting, I'd say that the the thrive, you know, is it would be very very appealing. That's interesting. It it does not feel stiff at all to me. Really, in comparison to um, a lot of the. You know, the Gen 2 carbon fiber face paddles. It, that's such a subjective thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've heard people say that the Ruby feels really stiff to them. When I was at that six-year event in Dallas, we were passing around Rubies, and some people were like, man, this thing is stiffer than the double black diamond. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? It was the total opposite for me. So, yeah. But I get it. It's just it's one of those things. It's You can't really 
talk about it objectively because it's such a, a personal personal thing. But right up there with the ruby, I mean, of course, the shape is very similar, if not exactly the same. So, but to me, the ruby is one of the best looking paddles out there. This one is right up there with it. Yeah, maybe even more so for me because I love the blue. I mean, it's it's certainly uni- unique, and I think there's something to say about that. You know, people are always kind of looking for paddles that catch your eye. Yeah, I hope you can see it in yeah. the, the camera. Um, and it's it's not something that hits you over the head, and you're like, oh wow, it's it's crazy blue. It's just very subtle. You have to kind of hold it. Yep, in a certain light and at a certain angle to kind of catch a glimpse of what makes it. But yeah, it's a it's a pretty paddle. So the reason uh, for all these variations in the Thrive lineup is that what they want to be able to offer something to every type of player out there. They do, and and they're very keen on really dialing in the swing weight, the twist weight, and the balance point. And you get the paddles, and it, it lists all of those for each paddle. Okay, like it gives gives you the twist weight. Swing weight, balance point, and a range of those within those paddles because they're always gonna there's always gonna be a little bit of a range in paddles. Just so I'm I'm thinking. I mean, I have no idea what uh, you're into next week, but I'm picturing. You know, uh, okay, my ideal paddle is, you know, in the 118 to 120 swing weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need a lot of forgiveness, so I'm looking for a twist weight that's fairly high, mm-hmm. and they're gonna set you up with. Uh, a version of their paddle, maybe with some customization. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. exactly right. Yeah. Almost like a golf club custom fitting. Exactly. I can't wait to see what they have to offer. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be also fun to see, you know, like how does how do my tastes compare to Chris's and Will's and yeah. Raiden's, you know. I know Will loves, similar to me, I think I've I've veered away from this to some extent, but he loved the elongated versions, you know. Hence the Willinator. Same. And I I played with Proline Energy for for months and months. That was my primary paddle, probably the longest, one of the longest primary paddles I've ever had. And before that, it was elongated paddles. And only recently have I switched. Well, not recently anymore. Three months ago, I switched to the Ruby, and that's <clears throat> the hybrid shape. And and now I see the benefits to it because it does broaden that sweet spot. There is more hand speed with it, less swing weight. So. You know, my tastes are, are changing, I think. But it'll be interesting to see how all four of us prefer paddles. It'll be an exciting podcast when you get back. Yeah. Are you going to do any uh, uh, filming while you're out there <clears throat> oh, with, yeah. the, with the guys? I'm taking all my cameras. Uh, I know that Pickleball Studio is going to have me and Braden on their podcasts, and I plan on doing a podcast, too, with, with all of them in it. So it's going to be tough to find enough things to talk about for three podcasts and Four I days. Think so <laughs> I think you'll figure <laughs> it out <laughs> without talking about the same subject. Wouldn't it be funny if we just did the same version of, of the podcast three times in a row? Yeah, <laughs> put maybe, it on our three channels. Maybe Porter and I will do our own podcast. There you buddy. go. <laughs> <laughs> Call it Porter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got one more paddle to, to talk about. We've got uh, a ProLite paddle. So ProLite is one of the legacy companies, and they were actually. I talked to the owner. Really nice guy. Uh, I think they started as a pickleball-only company way back in the 1980s, I want to say. So they've been around forever. And I think one of your first paddles was Pro Light, right? I think it was the Simone Jardim a signature model from way back when. Nice. I still can't get over that. You've played pickleball for, what, six years now? Yeah, just about. That's fantastic. But, yeah, so <clears throat> you don't see much of them anymore. You don't see pro players playing their paddles, but they've been flying under the radar, you know, making their paddles, and, you know, they still sell their paddles, obviously. And they sent me uh, the K2 Power as one of the kind of newer models. It's an edgeless with a hole in the throat. You can see the smiley face down here. Mm-hmm. It's a wide body paddle. I think it's over eight inches wide. Uh, grit texture. I can't remember the thickness, but it looks to be 14. And that's my guess right now. And yeah, we hit with it today. Uh, you know, I'd say it's not for me that I'd like a little longer handle. This handle must be four inches, maybe four and a half inches. <laughs> it's very short. <laughs> really short. Uh, there's there's certain, no two with that. No two Yeah, there's nowhere to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, otherwise, you know, it, it's a very control oriented paddle. I felt decent at the kitchen, you know, with it. Uh, so it's called the power. Would you call it a power? No, absolutely not. No. How about you? How did you feel about it? I felt like that um, the less I tried to muscle this paddle, the mm-hmm. better off it was. Yeah. If I just took an easy swing, um, it actually 
was pretty controllable, okay. I would say. And the amount of power that I got from such an easy swing mm -hmm. was notable. Would I call it a power paddle? No. But I think if, um, if all you're going to do is use one hand and, mm -hmm. and maybe you're lacking some strength, um, this is not a bad choice. I mean, the swing weight on it, it, it is as it's It's, it's I'd very say flexible. It's, it's, it's probably light. 110. Or very lower. maneuverable. I went the opposite direction with it. I was swinging it as hard as I can just because I was like, <laughs> right? I want to see how hard I can hit this thing. And it, one of the fun things about it is it's not powerful and you can swing with all your might and it still usually goes in, whereas other paddles, it's going to go 10 feet out. So, I mean, it's not, that's not a benefit to a paddle, clearly. But uh, I had fun just smacking the ball with it because uh, I could still control it. But yeah, it's definitely a, a control oriented paddle. Um, the dinks felt great with it. Uh, it's grit texture, so you probably doesn't get as I have it in my database actually, so you can look it up on johnqpickleball.com and look at the spin numbers. I think it's around maybe eighteen hundred or below. Uh, and the grit probably will wear off quicker than than a peel ply raw carbon fiber surface. But you know, I, I can't recall the the price of it, but I'm sure that there are some people who would enjoy this paddle. But. I can't think of another white paddle out there. Well, there's a couple, I guess. There's an icon up yeah, there. Icon. But yeah, that a couple might. folks remarked that the white was a little distracting to them. People in the oh, did Paula say that today? I heard her say something. But yeah, Sean did, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's an issue. One of the recent tur PPA tournaments, they didn't allow um, some of the Selkirk players to play with the power air that had the white mm -hmm. accents in it because it was too distracting. Okay, so the next segment is our deep dive into either gear or things that, it, that we're kind of doing with paddles. And I wanted to talk about my spin test methodology to piggyback on what Chris and Will were talking about on the Pickleball Studio this week, and I think it's kind of important for all of us to let everybody know exactly how we're doing it and let each other know how we're testing these paddles. And Chris and I have been in communication for a year now or more, longer than a year, about how we're doing the spin test, so we're very tuned into each other. But uh, but I think you know, there's a, a lot of people kind of are curious about how we're doing it, and. and I borrowed my technique directly from Chris. I remember watching a video over a year ago now where he and his brother went out and tested every paddle in his inventory. It was like 100 paddles or something they did in two days. And and they set up a camera, high-speed camera at 240 frames per second, filmed themselves doing top spin serves, and then counted the frames until you get one revolution of the ball. And then he had a website he was putting in. It was like it was a bowling website, I think, that calculated mm. RPM from frame rates. I developed a spreadsheet for mine, but I'm using the same methodology. And I'm also – I started with a lower frame rate camera. I think it was 120 max. was not good enough, not fast enough for – raw carbon fiber paddles with anything close above 1800 I'd say because at that at at 120 frames per second you're getting a lot of rotation of the ball and it's hard to see exactly how much rotation you get and you're kind of guessing you're coming up with like okay that's like 8.5 frames per revolution so I, I went and got a GoPro 11 which shoots at 240 frames per second and I was using that up until very recently when I also get purchased, invested in a Sony FX30, which is the same camera that Chris uses that allows you to shoot at 240 frames per second and low light, so indoor situations. That's the issue with the GoPro. It works perfectly fine outdoors, but you bring it indoors and you get all kinds of motion blur on the ball because it's it's not shooting at a fast enough um, speed. Shutter speed is lower and you get blur. One thing I do slightly differently, so I think Chris, I heard Chris saying he he has 10 balls that he covers in Sharpie over three-fourths of the ball. That That's one difference I have with him. And another is that he, he hits 10 serves and averages those. So what I do is I, I, I use either a Franklin ball that I, that I do a Sharpie stripe along one edge, so kind of a half-inch thick stripe, and then I write a number one on one side of the ball and number two on the other mm. side of the ball so I can see it rotating. And yeah, the reason why Chris uses kind of the three-fourths coverage method is that you can hit it from any direction and still see the rotation. That's valid. I just don't want to spend that much time with the Sharpie, so <laughs> I'm using a shortcut. But I drop the ball every time where the, the, the stripe is horizontal. So every time I hit it, you can that stripe is 
turning over head to head. If the stripe is turning with the ball's rotation, then you can't obviously count the the frame rate. So if if that sometimes that does happen, I just throw out that that image. Also, I, in addition to the Franklins, I use a gamma ball called the training ball, which is blue on one mm-hmm. half and yellow on the other mm-hmm. half, and that one really pops in the camera. And you can, you can even use – I've used my GoPro 11 in my garage. I've got like a garage set up with a, a tape on the wall at, at net height, and I can do – serves and, and use that in the garage and with the ambient outside light coming into the garage you can still use the gamma two-tone balls because there's you know even though there's a little bit of blur you can still still see very clearly the balls and count the count the rotations uh, but but one of my differences in terms of methodology with chris is that i serve eight serves on one face of the paddle, and then I flip that paddle over and hit another eight serves on the other face of the paddle. And the reason I do that is because I started noticing, particularly with prototypes that were sent to me, sometimes the the grit on each face was very different and was getting very different spin results. And I've I've had to send back or ask for a replacement paddle a couple of times because there was. 400 to 600 RPM difference between the faces of the paddle. So I think it's that's an important thing. I, I don't think I've talked to Chris about it, but I think you know if 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 we can all get on the page, same page, it's a useful thing because first of all, to notice whether or not there is a difference, and secondly, uh, it it gives you a, a better average, I'd say. And what I also do is I throw out the low outliers. So the pr- whole purpose of this is to get spin potential. So. Sometimes I'll slightly miss hit it, and I'll hit the ball, you know, off the sweet spot, and it's going to drop the RPM 400 compared. So I'm getting 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, and I hit one at 1,600. Clearly, I miss hit it. I don't want that to skew the results, so I throw that out. And that's why hitting eight on each side, I get 16 total. And then I throw out the outliers, and, and I basically take the, the top 12, I average 12, of the highest spin of those 16 hits. One one of the things I talked with Chris and 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 Will and Braden about is is we want to kind of start a club, not necessarily a club, but a group where we kind of standardize our methodologies. And but also I think you know it'd be worth us maybe even quarterly sitting down together and inviting other content uh, creators and paddle reviewers. And so that we're all on the same page. We're talking about power and pop in the same way, and we're talking and we're using the same methodology for spin. Even if we're not using the same machines or same cameras, we should be using the same, within reason, the same methodology. So uh, you know, our results on our reviews are are all comparable. It's almost like an ASTM standard for uh, processes, protocols, conditions, um, everything being standardized so that yeah. whatever you get on the back end uh, is consistent, right? Yeah. You know, I, could, I, I could even see this dovetailing. I, I don't have the time to do this, but it, maybe somebody could even start a, a nonprofit organization with the goal of kind of standardizing pickleball terminology mm-hmm. and methodology, and this could dovetail with you know PPA standards and USAP standards and that sort of thing. And you know, I, think, I think that would be useful. Well, John, you have an amazing tolerance for tedium. <laughs> you know why? It's because I study stone tools. I, right. I measure stone tools. And man, let me tell you, paddles are pretty interesting when you compare them to, to stone tools. Do you see uh, differences in, in the balls that you use? I mean, I can imagine that gamma training ball is probably not you know, quite the same as a Franklin, <laughs> which is not quite the same as a Dura. That's a, a good point. And you know, I've tested, I've, I've compared the, the Franklin ball to the gamma training ball, a two-tone ball, in terms of spin, and there's not a significant difference. I think the gamma ball might get slightly more spin. It's softer than mm-hmm. the Franklin, so the paddles tend to grab it more, but it's not anything where I see you know 100 RPM more with the gamma versus the Franklin, and I've directly compared both of these for over a year now, and and I'm getting really similar results. So, okay. so um, yeah, I feel, I feel comfortable using both interchangeably. I do think that with power and pop ratings, we need to be using the same ball. And that ball, for me, has been Franklin because there is a difference. Mm-hmm. There is a difference there. Mm-hmm. If you're using a Franklin with one paddle and a Dura with another paddle, you're going to get – it's going to throw off your results. You know. So I've been very consistent. I don't use the Gamma two-tone balls with power and pop um, miles per hour. And how do you make sure that you're consistent as the person doing the serving? 
yeah. in, this ca- in the case of power, right? Yeah. Um, I, and I've seen you serve 10 different ways just today. Uh-huh. So yeah. are, are you purposefully trying to, are you thinking, I got to maximize spin on this test, so I'm going to serve in this particular way. Yeah. And then how do you do that day after day, test after test? Right. So I, I certainly have a open stance, top, heavy top spin serve, and I have a closed stance power st- serve. So the power serve looks a lot like deckle bars. You know, I kind of drop it and get up on my tippy toe and, and hit it as high as I can, uh, but within legal range. So I do. I have a, an app with my radar gun that records video as well. So it shows me a video of the serve, and it says 56 miles per hour. And I look at that video, and I can stop it and make sure I, I'm not hitting an illegal serve. So I, I feel like the, the legal parameters of a serve before this whole PPA serve nonsense, mm-hmm. you know, you can still throw the ball up, mm-hmm. but you got to hit it underhanded. And the top of the paddle has to be below your wrist where it bends, and you have to be hit, hitting in an upward motion. And it has to be below your navel, right, where you hit it. Uh, so that alone standardizes my, my power uh, serve. I, I do feel like, you know, certainly over the course of a year, that I've been doing this, I've gotten better at that serve. And there's been a little bit of creep upwards, I'm sure. But I have gone back and retested a couple of paddles, the the Rhombus, not the Nova, but the Pulsar. Uh, I wanted to recheck that one when I was doing the Nova review. And I had done the power testing on that paddle months ago. I want to say six months prior to when I retested it. And I retested it, and it was, it was like 0.1 miles per hour above what my original one was. I'm not saying that every one of my my measurements is going to be that exact, but it gave me some confidence that okay, it's not you know, this isn't all for naught. It's not completely bogus. You know, there is some consistency in that, and I, I know that intuitively. I can feel when a power is more, when a paddle is more powerful, and I get a higher rating. You know, the the Gearbox Pro Power, for example. Yeah. I knew as soon as I hit that, this is going to be close to or the top of the charts, and it was. And I'd say pop is a little more harder to get standardized, and there's less variability in terms of the miles per hour in pop. They're all right around 35 miles per hour. for, And the way I'm measuring pop is I'm, I'm dropping the ball and holding my paddle at chest length and at, at my chest and, and doing a punch volley with the paddle. And I do think that the pop measurement is just one version of pop. You know, it's one version of pop. And that is sort of the punch volley and the short strokes. And that's with the ball being static. When the ball's coming at you and you're flicking it and that sort of thing, I think that approximates that, but it's also a different measurement. It's also a different measurement than just holding your paddle still right. and somebody drilling the ball at you and you you just, you know, resetting the ball. That's the version of pop too, but that's not the same pop as punch mm-hmm. volley pop, you know. So I, there's there's room for expanding our, our measurements for sure. Let's move on to uh, kind of the gear of the week stuff that we are using this week. And I wanted to talk about this reset spray that you spray on your paddle. And the purpose of it is to replace the paddle erasers or an alternative to the paddle erasers for cleaning paddle surfaces. And this is not just limited to raw carbon fiber paddles like the Mm -hmm. eraser, but also for grip paddles and any kind of paddle you can clean with this. So the owners of Reset, uh, all of us, Chris, Will, and I met at Nationals in Dallas. They had a stand set up, and they were nice enough to give us these bottles. And I didn't get a chance to use it for quite a while, but you can see I've I've used it a few times since. So uh, the idea is you spray it on your paddle, and then can you grab that uh, microfiber cloth? It comes with a microfiber cloth. You let it sit on your paddle for you know, 30 seconds or so, and then you just wipe it with the fiber cloth. And there are emulsifiers in it, which are supposed to kind of bring out and loosen up the debris inside the grit in the paddle. And then you wipe it off with the microfiber cloth. And the idea is it's less damaging to particularly raw carbon fiber surfaces than the eraser. Now, that last claim I'd say is is unfounded. I know Chris did an experiment where he basically rubbed a raw carbon fiber paddle with an eraser until the eraser started smelling it. It was burning. Like yeah, That's how forceful he was rubbing it. And he stare tested it before and after this this heavy usage of the eraser, and there was no difference in the stare testing. So the stare is a machine that measures the peaks and valleys of the grit, right? So it's mm-hmm. highly scientific and precise. Mm-hmm. So, so far as we know, the erasers are not damaging to raw carbon fiber, 
So, you know, I understand the appeal of using a microfiber cloth because it probably will do less damage to, certainly less damage to grit paddles. You're not supposed to use erasers on grit paddles, so don't do that because it will take off the grit. So that's a great alternative for grit paddles, but I wouldn't say that it's... The spray is a great alternative. A great al- yeah, the spray it. is a great alternative. But I wouldn't say it's a better alternative than an eraser for the paddles. And the fact I, I just used it on the blackout. No. Uh, so you spray it on and, and then you wipe it off and it looks great uh, until it dries and then you can still see that there's... So this, this is the side of the paddle with, uh, that I use the reset spray on. You can see, still see there's some stuff inside there. Uh, it, it's not just the microfiber cloth shedding. There's also some ball dust in there. So I don't know how many sprays and, and repeats you'd have to do to get all of that out. But this is the other side I used a eraser on, and this is, you know, one cleaning with the eraser, you know, several passes up and down. Uh, and it's far cleaner. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it in the video, but uh, there's far less ball dust and, and debris in general on the side that I clean with the eraser versus the side I clean with. Yeah, I, I can't really spot any ball dust on the side that you did with the eraser. No, no. Now, I will say that there there's an advantage to this even for the Ruby. So originally we thought the Ruby would be totally fine to use an eraser on. Six Zero has since come out and said, don't use an eraser on the Ruby because it has a tendency, it has the potential to pull out the Kevlar fibers. Mm. And I've seen some pictures of paddles that have actually had uh, like little whiskers sticking out of them. It hasn't happened to mine. I've, I've used the eraser on it since the beginning. I don't use it anymore after hearing that. But this is a good alternative to the eraser. And I found that the Ruby doesn't really collect ball dust the same way that raw carbon fiber paddles do. I don't have a lot of ball dust on the Ruby to, to clean. So I, did, I don't feel the need to clean it very often. But every couple few weeks, I will use the reset spray on that. It seems to clean it just fine. You think the caution for the pure Kevlar would be the same holding for the a paddle like the Thrive or the... The no, apes. no, the apes never had an issue with the those whiskers forming right. or pulling out of the, out of through the uh, peel ply, and I, I used the eraser on the Pro Line Energy the entire time, and I imagine it's the same way for the Azul. You know, it again, it's the hybrid carbon fiber Kevlar, and my my hunch is that you can use a, an eraser on that too. But this is good either in combination with the eraser. Uh, I have used both, you know, and it, it is nice to kind of use both to to kind of loosen things up with the reset spray, wipe it down, and then use the eraser. That gives it super, super clean. Um, and obviously, this is great for people that use uh, grit paddles. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to bash on this. I don't, I don't think it's as good as an eraser for raw carbon fiber, but there's potential here. Maybe they can change the formula and get it to, to work a little better or come up with something with the spray and something similar to an eraser instead of just the microfiber cloth because I don't, I don't think clearly this isn't pulling out the debris from deep within the, the weaves of the raw carbon fiber. So I tried the spray and then using the eraser to almost like wipe it off with the eraser. Yeah, how'd that work? And I would say the results were similar to just using the spray. Oh, okay. So, so it kind of... Yeah, so it was much better with just the eraser than with the... Okay, sp- it kind of smears the yeah, debris yeah, yeah, around. Yeah. Okay. But you know those erasers have a dual purpose. You can clean your um, your sandpaper and your your grip tape on your skateboard and get those looking very clean. Did you know that? Yeah. So I, you know, I'm a long time skateboarder. I don't know if you knew that about me. But, no. Uh, I used to. I had a skateboard shop with my mom in high school. Yeah, and uh, that was fantastic. And then all through college, I worked at skate parks, and I I, I still skate. I, I do longboarding, uh, and I've I've. I did pretty high intensive skateboarding up until I broke my hip at a skate park, just slamming into concrete way too hard. It's just way too injury prone yeah, when you're yeah. when you're older. Your body can't handle slamming into concrete. Go figure. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, I I was very familiar with the grip tape cleaners, and it's the same thing. Did you have anything you want to talk about gear wise? Something about a net? Well, guys, I'm looking for. Um, you know, I have a garage like a lot of people. It's mm-hmm. actually on the large side. It's flat. And uh, I'm looking for like a rebounder net to uh, just drill a little bit in the winter time. Mm-hmm. And um, just shopping around, there's really nothing pickleball specific that I've seen. Um, so if anybody has any ideas out there for a, a good rebounder, you mean so something that throws the ball back at yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Not just a solid wall, but something that will give a little bit 
uh, give a little bit of energy back to the ball. Yeah. You know, I I spent a lot of time drilling in my garage, and it started just with, you know, I I wanted a a space to do spin testing and power and pop testing. So I I put tape up on the wall of the garage to at the same height, even with the two-inch difference between the center of the net and the edges. Mm -hmm. It's also a great place to, to drill, and I've come up with several drills that are very helpful. The most helpful one is to stand. I also have tape in, on the floor of the garage for the kitchen right. and then the baseline. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really useful to stand in no man's land in the transition zone and just drill balls at the wall that land at your feet and practice resetting those balls. So hit a hard ball into the wall, it comes back at your feet or even knee level and just right. practice, you know. So you can those practice drives, flicks, and then the reset and get a couple of drills in at once. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, that's a. It's useful to have. So I've been hitting balls against the drywall of the garage, mm-hmm. and of course that reverberates throughout the whole house. This, <laughs> yeah, the, the wall of the garage I hit into <laughs> is directly into the head of our our bed in the master bedroom. So I have to wait until Michelle is up, right. and right. there's no way for me to drill early in the morning. Yeah, so something a little bit quieter than you know a, a wall. Uh huh. Uh, but with a little bit more energy return as well. So, you know, they have these things for lacrosse and for baseball, probably for tennis. My guess is the weight of the pickleball is something specific to a, a certain grade of net yeah. or spring action. So, I don't know. You, we'll see what's out there. you just come up with a new product. You better <laughs> patent that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. In the meantime, John, I've been drilling with this uh, device. It's called the Top Spin Pro. Have you seen that? Is that the thing that kind of sits in a spindle and you slap yeah, it? Yeah, okay. exactly. And the, the angle of the thing is kind of preset to, to what the designers of the product deem to be a correct top spin angle. Mm-hmm. A paddle angle mm-hmm. uh, for a proper top spin. So it's, I don't know what the degree is, but it helps you sort of just groove that top spin swing, mm-hmm. uh, both on forehand side and backhand side. Um, the ball is on a spindle, but it's on a spring loaded spindle. So you can put some energy into the ball and know that you're actually putting some force into it and not just spinning the ball. Okay. I find it to be a great, um, great drill for just getting that muscle memory down. Mm-hmm. Uh, even before a game like ours today, just to know that when I get to the court, uh, I'm already kind of in the groove a little bit. Yeah. That's a great tool. Man, you don't need any more help with your topspin. <laughs> For the love of God, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> You're going to get too good. Oh, thanks, John. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to Q&A. Yeah. Unless you have more gear to talk about. Nope. Let's roll. Okay. So one big question that keeps showing up on my review of the Ruby, as well as other paddle reviews and even on our podcast, is how is the spin on the Ruby holding up? And my typical response is it feels about like the same as a raw carbon fiber in terms of how the spin is degrading. So nothing crazy, but I had noticed, first of all, the texture gets smooth, smoother as, as you wait on the paddle, and there's some spin loss, but not not something significant where I still Mm -hmm. I can't play with it anymore but I wanted to test it so I I did retest the spin results and I'll put the table I have here up in post but um, but I compared the 6-0 Ruby to some other paddles that I had data on kind of this historical data so I've 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 used paddles for three months before and I usually do test the spin after I retire a paddle so I know what the spin was when I first got it versus how it was when I <clears throat> when I retired it. I looked at the 6-0 Ruby. I looked at the Gearbox Pro Power because I'm also very curious about that. And I, I haven't used this as my primary paddle, but you have. And mm-hmm. you've played with it for exactly three months now. So this is a perfect comparison because I have played with the Ruby for three months as well. Uh, I also played with the Pro Kinex Black Ace over a year ago for three months. So that I also threw that into the database. My uh, Pickleball Apes Pro Line Energy, I also have data on the Yola Hyperion CFS and the Yola Solaire. And the last one was the um, Selkirk Power Air, which is not raw carbon fiber, but I wanted to throw this in as kind of an outlier. Anyway, um, what I looked at and uh, is kind of the average spin loss over a month. So let's first talk about the Ruby. So the original... Over are, one month or three months? I averaged over one month because some of these paddles I only played with for a month okay, to get gotcha. the data. So I wanted to get something that can pair all these. Got it. Okay, so the 6-0 Ruby started at a RPM, spin RPM of 2271, so close to 2300 RPM. That's which is, massive. Yeah, which is high top tier. 
after three months, uh, that had deteriorated to 1929 RPM. So just under 2000 RPM, which is 342 RPM spin loss over three months. Okay. Which I'd say is about average. In fact, the data do show that it is about average for a raw carbon fiber. It's not raw carbon fiber, it's raw Kevlar, but the spin loss is about the same. So I'd say I'm, I'm still, I'm very happy with where the Ruby is now, three months, and I've been using it. You've seen me use it. I, I, I test other paddles, but I always go back to the mm -hmm. Ruby for my primary. And I have, it's got three solid months of, of play. And given that it's just under 2,000 RPM, it's still in that high slash top tier range. Yeah, I think that's very good for, for a paddle. Some of you have probably seen my old video about the Yola Hyperion uh, losing its spin. And that was back when I was like, why are these paddles losing right. their spin? Yep. So that one started at 1725 and three months later dropped down to 1333. And that's a loss of 392 within the same time frame. So Ruby 342, Yola Hyperion 392. Okay, Prokinex Black Ace. Lost 323 RPM in three months, so a little better than the Ruby. The Apes Proline Energy lost 386 RPM in three months, so slightly worse than the Ruby. In between the Ruby and the Yola Hyperion, the Yola Solaire lost over over one month. It lost 143, which when you compare that to the others within one month, that's one of the worst. So in comparison to the Ruby, 114 RPM in, in one month. The Solaire, 143 in one month. Gearbox Pro Power, I was very curious about this because Raphael from the owner of Gearbox, when I was chatting with him before I released the review of the Gearbox Pro Power and Control, uh, he was saying that they have a different method of, of curing their peel ply for their raw carbon fiber surface, and it involves several stages of heat and pressure and, and decreasing the temperature, increasing the temperature, and, and he was saying that it probably results in a, a more durable face and so far so good so i tested your paddle that you've been playing with and after three months it's lost only 235 rpm so that's pretty significant what was the starting point for that oh uh, so i started at 2062 so just in at the bottom of the top tier le mm -hmm. level and dropped to 1827 Okay, so that's not much loss at all. So it does seem to have some validity in Raphael's claims that the gearbox raw carbon fiber surfaces are more durable. Of course, that's an N equals one sample size, right. so I'm not going to, you know, talk too much about that or put too much weight into that. But well, uh, all of these are right. Yeah, all of these, all of these are. And I want to test Paula's. Paula is also our friend has been playing with the Gearbox Pro Power now for three months or even longer. A little bit longer. Yeah. So I'll test hers too and see where we get. Okay. So again, the lineup of here here is Gearbox Pro Power losing RPM the least, followed by Pro Kinex Black Ace, followed by the Ruby, followed by the Apes Pro Line Energy, followed by the Yola Hyperion, followed by Yola Solaire. And then there's the Selkirk Power Air, which again is grit. And I talked about this in one of my videos early last year. It started at 2100 RPM, 2176 RPM. I played with it for a month and that thing got glassy smooth within that month. I knew it was losing spin. I retested it after a month. It dropped to 1172 RPM. That's a loss Wait, of over- Wait, from a starting point from where? 2100. It's a loss a of thousand. over 1000 RPM. Now, caveat here, I I sent it to Selkirk and they did um, send me a new one under warranty. And they don't usually do that for surfaces, but they were like, yeah, something is screwy here. Mm. So something something happened on that particular paddle. Uh, and I don't suspect that you're going to get that kind of uh, loss and spin for all of their grit paddles. In fact, I know you shouldn't. I've seen people play with them for months and months and they're still, still getting good spin. But that one was an anomaly. But it's just an example and an outlier to throw in here to show that, yeah, you can get massive drops in, sure. in spin. Another thing I wanted to talk about briefly is that looking at three months of a spin loss versus one month of spin loss, I don't think it's a linear descent and uh, drop off and spin. I think that you get a steep drop off and spin for the first month and then it levels out after that at a lesser rate. And that's just from my experience with raw carbon fiber. I would say anecdotally, I, that seems to hold true for yeah. me. So to answer your question about the Ruby, very average, I'd say spin loss for raw carbon fiber paddles. And Raw carbon fiber paddles, in my experience, lose their spin at a lesser rate than do grit grit paddles. Are you planning to continue this uh, evaluation for six months or 
Do you even keep a paddle for that long to yeah, be able to make a reasonable? The only paddle I played with test. for six months was that old uh, Electro Electrum. Model E. And why is that? Because just the technology that comes out is just so much better. Yeah. From generation to generation. Yeah, I have so many options now. It's yeah. hard to stick with the paddle for, for that long. But you know, I I generally I'm on the three month plan. You know, I generally stick with the paddle for three months and and then find something that I enjoy better, you know. But I'm still on the Ruby. I don't intend on not playing with the Ruby anytime soon. So maybe it'll make it to four months before I switch to another primary. Uh, and if so, I'll, I'll check in on the spin on that again and see where it is. Have you tried to hit a, a new Ruby since you've been playing with yours for quite some time now? I haven't. No, I haven't had the opportunity. But, you know, 300 mm. RPM difference is about where you start really noticing it on the paddle, you know, 100 RPM, it's not going to make much of a difference. 200, I can notice it. 300 is pretty significant. So a 300 RPM drop, I do notice the difference in the Ruby. But I, but another thing to talk about here is where the paddle starts at, right? Mm-hmm. They're all going to start losing the grit and RPM. But if you start at 2300, you can play with the thing for three months and you can still be in the top tier category. If you start at 1700, Drop 300. Right, so that, that percentage loss is an interesting metric, Exactly, right? exactly. So something to consider when you're buying a new paddle if spin is important to you. And this is not going to be the same for everybody. I tend to hit pretty hard. You know, I wouldn't think that you'd get this much of a drop across the board. You hit very hard also. Uh, I think, you know, if, if your game is more control-oriented, um, you're not going to get this this steep of a drop-off. But, you know, it gives you an idea of... of What's going on among the paddles, John? Will you post your table somewhere? Yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll put it on the screen and post, and also yeah, I'll, I'll put it up for people to download on my website. Be interesting for people to chime in and with any comments they have about the spin on their paddles. Yeah, see if they have similar, at least uh, anecdotal thoughts about yeah spin loss. Yeah, I'm sure there are people out there that are not reviewing paddles that are also either testing spin themselves or capable of testing spin. So now that you know how it's done, it, it would be fun to to hear from people that have done it themselves and compare and contrast their spin rates to what we're getting as reviewers. Have you noticed any change in, in power for these or other paddles? Have you done similar kinds of tests there? You know, I haven't. And there could be, I mean, there's the break-in period where right. the where Paddles like the gearbox get more powerful, and that is noticeable. Um, it also happened with the proton paddles; they they get better as as after a couple weeks of play. I noticed they're playing a lot hotter. For things like the Ruby, I don't notice any power difference, and it okay. could be that I'm just becoming attenuated to the mm-hmm. power drop, if if that's even a thing with the paddle, uh, because it's so subtle that I'm just kind of getting used to it, and you know. It's not not hitting my radar, but yeah, I've I've not. That's something inter- interesting. Maybe I'll start doing also, and uh, when I retire a paddle, instead of just spin testing it, also look at power and pop. So I, I had heard like like you have that the gearbox did require a break-in period. I don't know if that sort of biased my um, observations of the gearbox, but it seems to have picked up power, but then leveled off. Mm. Um, and that picking up of power, that increase in power, probably took a full month oh, really? of okay. playing with it. Interesting. Um, to where it sort of just became unnoticeable, the change. Yeah, I didn't play with mine as a primary, but I played with it solid for two weeks for the review or more. And then pretty heavily off and on after that for another few weeks. And and I noticed the, the break-in period, I'd say over the course of two weeks, like I got it. It it became it topped out its power level, you know. Yeah, but so. the original gearbox that you had let me borrow, mm-hmm. uh, it was powerful from the get go. Oh, really? Do you, you remember playing with it? Yes, right out of the box. Yeah. Okay, it did get hotter when I played with it after those two weeks. But yeah, maybe it started hotter than than yours. Could be, and probably less of a ascent up to. That's right. It's finished. Right. Because I I didn't just power test and pop test mine. <clears throat> Somebody actually sent me theirs. He was concerned that his was there was a whole whole thing after they were released that people were saying that they weren't powerful and poppy, and he didn't think his was. And I tested it, and it was it was within the range of, of mine. So, yeah, I mean, different mechanics for different people. Right. Different people are going to get different results different from styles. paddles, you know. Sure. So, but I don't think I ever power tested 
yours, but I have played with yours and it feels exactly the same as mine. I'd like to see some of your, your spin numbers on, you did, you know, your paddles of the year 2023 and you yeah. had a spin category. I would like to see how those spin numbers change over time. I think that the takeaway point here is that hitting a ball against a paddle, a hard plastic ball against a paddle is going to reduce the spin potential for sure. And raw carbon fiber is an advancement. It's, it's an improvement over grit. <laughs> They've made improvements in grit as well, like the grit that they're using on the new Selkirks are better than the old grit they used to use. And But yeah, it's and we'll, we'll shelve this topic for another podcast, but we can kind of explore this idea of should we expect paddles to last as long as tennis rackets, for example, or should we consider paddles more like shoes where they're going to wear down, right? And you're spending sometimes $200 on a pair of shoes that – you, you don't really expect to last for years. You know that the surface, the, the sole of the shoe is going to wear down on, on courts. I, I'm still leaning towards, you know, we need to have more durable paddles. If we're paying 200 bucks on paddles, they should be closer to a tennis racket than shoes. But it's, it's a topic of debate, I, guess, I suppose, that we can kind of explore. I'm okay with, you know, three to four paddles per year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you compare it to golf or skiing or, Mm-hmm. many other sports that are equipment intensive. The capital outlay is far greater for those than even for those of us who may replace our paddles yeah. frequently. So I'm happy to spend the money. Yeah. But I also realize that there are people that don't don't have the exp- of course. expendable income. And, you know, I tend to get tired of paddles too. I love trying new paddles and not everybody's the same way. Sean, we played with today, He's been playing with the same paddle for years, you know. <laughs> it's the same paddle after it wears out, you know. It, yeah. A lot of people that just just love playing with the same paddle and, and don't like to change it up, you know. So it would be nice for those people to – I'm sure they they would rather a paddle last longer than, than not. So Sure. Anyway, that's, that's it. That's all I got for today. You got any other stories or anything you want to talk about? No, just looking forward to more play, more mm-hmm. fun. There's some uh, – leagues coming up uh, that I'm really interested in uh, a couple more tournaments coming up soon mm-hmm. we've got all these indoor places now and they're they're starting to ramp up the tournament season so looking forward to getting out there in a, in a competitive sense me too uh, we keep saying Eddie that we're going to sign up for tournaments and then a week passes and we're in a podcast again and we haven't signed up so let's do it this week this is the week John. this is the week we're going right. to make it happen we're going to sign up for at least one maybe we can get a couple that sounds great on the docket All right, man. Good to talk to you again. Fun. Yeah. See you next week. You got it.